Much of the secondary information that marketing researchers use comes from external sources. Let's take a look at some of the most typical places that we find useful secondary information to answer marketing research questions. Government sources, trade associations, professional journals, academic journals, commercial services, and social media and web tools highlight some of the key categories where we can find useful secondary information. In the following slides, we'll offer some illustrative examples of these types of secondary information and how they can be used by marketers in the real world. One caveat before we begin, we live in a world where Googling has made it so easy for us to find the types of information that we usually need to solve day-to-day -day problems. However, Googling or standard web searching is almost always inadequate to properly find the most useful secondary information to answer a marketing research question. There's two primary reasons why standard web search tools don't quite get us where we need to be when it comes time to go searching for secondary information. First, a lot of the secondary information that marketers might want to use is actually stored within some sort of online database where we have to actually interface with the database itself, deriving queries within the database to extract the information. So that means we need to know where those secondary databases are and we'd have a deep, intimate knowledge of what those databases can provide to us. Google won't do that for us. Secondly, a lot of the useful information that we want to have gain access to is hidden behind paywalls. Trade associations, for example, often collect useful information to marketers, but then they hide that information behind a paywall that you have to subscribe to or pay for the report. Luckily for us, in many cases, our academic libraries also aggregate this, sim this same types of information. Government sources provide enormous amounts of secondary information that's useful to marketers. This can come from local, state, national, and international government sources. The example that we're gonna use here is perhaps one of the most common sources used by marketing researchers in the United States, and that is secondary information that comes from the United States Census Bureau. Now, if you go to the census.gov website, there's numerous different tools that the census has built out to make it easy and useful to search from the, uh, the wide variety of information they have available. Let's illustrate just one of these tools in the videos here. And again, I encourage you to go to census.gov to see all the different variety of tools that are made available. But in this particular example, I'm using their current population survey table creator tool, the CPS table creator. In this particular tool, I'm able to select from a variety of different variables and create cross tabs to find detailed information about these sources. So in this particular example, let's imagine that I'm interested in finding, finding out which types of people are more or less likely to have health coverage in the United States. So let's see, I wanna get a count of all people here in the most recent year. When I define my table, I have to select my row in my column. So I'm imagining my cross tab now. And I can do multiple headers, but in this case, it should be relatively easy. First, I'm looking for individuals health insurance coverage, so whether they do or do not have health insurance. For the column, I'm going to use their detailed educational attainment. This is a pretty standard cross tab, so it'll be easy to illustrate what the results look like here. I could check the help menu here to learn more about how these different uh, advanced features work. For the statistics, don't want percentages, want actual estimated total values. So there's no need for me to change any of the settings here. Then finally, I'm not actually using age ranges. I'm actually using education and I don't intend to subset by age ranges. So I don't need to mess with anything here either. Now that I've set all these things, I should probably notice that there's also a place here where I can do subset. So right now I'm gonna be getting results for all uh, US people that are coded in the census but I could also sort by state, sex, and so on. Then click Get Table. It takes but a moment. I notice here that the data was collected in 2015, but this is actually for health insurance coverage, whether or not they had it in 2014, and whether they were insured or uninsured. I don't know anything about the quality of the insurance they had, just whether they, were, they had health insurance or did not have health insurance. And I see that all the numbers reported here are in thousands. So in total, we see about 316 million individuals of that if we round up just a little bit about 33 million people were uninsured now if we look across educational attainment we can see some differences in the amount of insured versus uninsured across the different groups however 
there's large disparities in the number of people who have different levels of educational attainment. For example, here, only a few people, or relatively few people, have doctorate degrees, 3.6 million, whereas 46.5 million people actually have bachelor's degrees. So when we just look at these numbers via eyeball, it's hard to compare the relative rates of insured to not insured. So what I did was I copied that table, I pasted it into Excel, I calculated the percentage of people within each educational group as uninsured and uninsured, green being insured, red being uninsured, and suddenly by looking at it at a percentage basis within educational attainment, it becomes much clearer about which types of individuals are less likely to be insured based on their educational level. For example, people who have less than a ninth grade education, 78% of them were had health insurance, 22% did not. Those with professional degrees, master degrees, and doctorate degrees have around 95%. So this is just one example of a government source that can be useful to a marketer. Obviously, marketers selling healthcare on the new healthcare exchanges would be very interested in knowing which types of individuals are more or less likely to be presently insured. And this is a tool that uh, government tools can be used to provide that types of information. Trade associations are another prevalent source for external secondary information. Trade associations can be very useful to marketing researchers looking for topics on a particular industry or product category because trade associations tend to serve as advocates for all companies that participate in that industry. As such, they tend to have a vested interest in generating useful research that can be insightful and helpful to all members of that industry, and in turn, to marketing researchers studying that industry. Let me provide an example of how trade associations can provide useful marketing research for, our, for secondary research purposes by way of maybe my favorite trade association, the Brewers Association. The Brewers Association is the association that serves the craft brewer market. And we found a report here about the Brewers Association member hop usage survey. For those of you who know about craft beer, you know that hops are very important to the taste of beer and hops are very uh, commonly used, particularly in San Diego uh, IPAs. As an example of a type of report that the Brewers Association generated, take a look at this chart here. What we're seeing here is the amount of hops that are used per amount of produced beer. And what we're seeing here from 2007 to 2015 is a positive trend where more hops are being used for the same amount of beer. In other words, craft brewers are stuffing more and more hops into the beer that they're producing. So this signals, if you're a marketing researcher, this signals that the trend of heavily hopped beers is going to likely continue, at least in the near future, as evidenced by the, the behavior of the entire industry. As another example, this report gave us information about the top 10 varieties of hops that are used in producing craft beers. You'll notice that Cascade and Centennial, these are two types of hops that are produced, remain the most popular, but you'll see a lot of shifting here from the third, fourth, fifth, and to 10th most popular hops. This could be useful to a marketing researcher who's studying upcoming trends in beer and they realize there's a lot of innovation that's still occurring within this space of how to hop a beer and create tasty beers that craft beer consumers want to drink. As another piece of evidence, this is the total number of varieties used by U.S. craft brewers. And we see here in 2014, 132 different types of hops were being reported as used in the production of craft beer, whereas in 2008-2009, only about 90 and 88 different varieties of hops were used. So yet again, these pieces of information could be useful to the marketing researcher conducting secondary research into craft beer because they all point to the increasing use of hops and the increasing variety of hops to serve the picky palates of craft beer consumers. Professional journals are another common source of useful secondary information for marketing researchers. Similar to trade associations, these professional journals are particularly designed to serve all of the members in a participating industry or product category. And as such, the information that they produce is often useful to marketing researchers conducting inquiries into that product category or that industry as well. In fact, marketing research is in of itself an industry. Perhaps the most popular professional journal for marketing research is Quirks. Let's give an example here from an article that came in February of 2016 that studied the impact of this length of a survey on completion rates amongst millennial respondents. Of course, marketing researchers are very interested in 
when people will or will not complete online surveys. In this study, serving the entire professional audience of marketing researchers directly answered that question, uh, investigated that question, and particularly in relation to how millennials responded. What we see here is a scatter plot, each dot representing a different study that this company actually conducted online. On the y-axis, we have the completion rate, so 100% would mean every single person entering the survey completed the survey. 55% down here would mean 55% of the people who started the survey actually finished. And on the x-axis, we have survey duration. So longer surveys are here on the right-hand side. If you look at the scatter plot, it's clear that as the survey takes longer, no surprise, there's a tendency for people, and particularly millennials, to be less likely to complete the survey. If we go back and read the actual article, we'll see that millennials are particularly more sensitive to longer surveys, suggesting that marketing researchers have to think about shortening their online surveys as we want to reach this millennial audience and gather information about them. Now taking a look at the beverage industry as an example, there's numerous different professional journals that are available for the interested marketing researcher. This is a incomplete list. BevNet, Beverage Industry, Beverage World, Beverage Digest, Beverage Business Insights, all represent professional journals that provide insights into the beverage industry. Marketing researchers can make good use of this as well. Unfortunately, much of this information is hidden behind a paywall. You have to be a paid subscriber to actually consume the most important information that they have to share. Luckily, the SDSU library provides access to most of these articles through the online databases we're subscribed to. These professional journals aren't just journals. They have online blogs, YouTube channels, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. These can also be useful sources of information for marketing researchers. For example, Beverage World has a YouTube video that's an hour long talking about the entire state of the 2015 beverage market. Academic journals and academic research can also be a useful source of secondary information for marketing research practitioners. Journal of Marketing, Journal of Marketing Research, Marketing Science, the Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science, Journal of Consumer Research, Journal of Consumer Psychology. This is just a short list of academic journals that regularly conduct research that are of interest to marketing practitioners. However, if you're not used to reading academic journals, sometimes it can be a little intimidating to understand what academics are studying about consumers, how that might actually apply to everyday marketing practice. Let's give one example here. Here's an article from the Journal of Consumer Psychology in 2012. The title of the article is The Relative Visual Saliency Differences Induce Sizable Bias in Consumer Choice. That's a mouthful. However, it turns out this research could be very pragmatic and useful to everyday marketing researchers. For example, what we see here is one figure representing the results of one of the experiments that these authors reported upon in this article. In their study, they asked people to make a choice between two different products. In this particular case, one of the products was a product that we knew that the consumer strongly preferred. The example here could be peanut butter M&Ms. The other product was a product that the consumer did not prefer. However, this product was made visually salient or highly visible, something that you quickly and instantaneously noticed when you just glanced at it. So in this particular example, I picked Funyuns as an example. And to suggest visual saliency, notice how I brighten this up while the M&Ms are a little more darkened. So with these two products being presented to individuals, the idea was to see which product they would choose. Now in the long run, if the person had enough time, since we knew they preferred peanut butter M&Ms, you would suspect that the person always would select peanut butter M&Ms. After all, they didn't prefer Funyuns. However, that wasn't the case when we, people, when we gave individuals only a short amount of time to make their choice. Down here on the x-axis, you'll see a series of times. These are milliseconds, so this represents here one second. So there were five different lengths of time people were given to make their choice between the two products. 100 milliseconds meant they had a tenth of a second to make a choice, whereas at 1500 milliseconds, the person had 1.5 seconds to make a choice. In other words, a relatively long amount of time. On the y-axis, we see the percentage of which food product was chosen. So the orange area here represents the preferred product. In the blue represents the non-preferred but visually salient product. So when you gave someone 1.5 seconds, nearly everybody selected their preferred product. Very few people selected the product that was merely salient. However, when we gave individuals only a very short amount of time to make their choice, 
not quite half, but a large proportion of them chose the visually salient product and not the product they actually preferred. Now imagine if you're a marketer thinking about product packaging designs for low involvement or impulse buy goods. This would suggest that thinking about designing packaging that's actually visually salient might be a useful way to increase sales. So relative visual saliency differences induce sizable bias in consumer choice sounded like a big academic mouthful, but when we looked a little closer, we realized that this gave us some interesting insights that could apply to solving a practical marketing problem. Now, not all academic research resides in academic journals. For example, let's take a look at the American Customer Satisfaction Index. The AXI is an annual survey of approximately 70,000 U.S. consumers covering over 300 different companies. The objective of the AXI is to longitudinally track how satisfied customers are with the various companies that they buy products from. What they do is they use both online and telephone based surveys to measure people's expectations, perceived quality, and perceived value of a company's offerings to create a composite satisfaction index score for that company. So when we say an index score, we mean that any given company could have an AXI score ranging from zero, meaning no satisfaction at all, to 100, meaning everyone is completely satisfied. The AXI is very useful for numerous, num, uh, numerous reasons, but one of the things that marketers often do with the AXI is they use it to benchmark themselves against other industry competitors. For example, let's take a look at the supermarket category. From 2009 to 2016, the AXI score for the entire supermarket category remained relatively flat and relatively high at a score of 75 although there was some notable dip in the score from 2016 and 2015. Now let's look a little closer at some of the individual companies in the supermarket industry that's being tracked by the AXI. Right away, we can see that across the industry, scores remain relatively stable for any given company, but there are definitely differences in the overall satisfaction for each company. Let's look yet a little closer. We see that Walmart systematically underperforms in terms of customer satisfaction compared to the relative average. Publix systematically overperforms the industry average when it comes to customer satisfaction of supermarkets. And Whole Foods tracks somewhat similar to the industry average, typically outperforming, although very recently uh, experiencing a notable dip in overall customer satisfaction. Everyday marketers have such a voracious need for useful information, many marketing research companies actually specialize in selling special commercial services that provide useful marketing information to marketers themselves. For example, let's look at Q scores. You may have heard the word Q score uh, bandied about in everyday conversation when talking about celebrities. Q score is an attempt to measure the overall likingness of a celebrity, athlete, or cartoon or comic book character amongst those people who are aware of that celebrity athlete or comic book character. The way Q scores are measured is rather easy. People are asked to take a Q score survey. They're presented names of various individuals and then they simply score them as one of their favorites. Very good, good, fair, poor, or they say they never seen or heard this person before. From this we can actually derive an individual's Q score. So first, we take all the individuals who completed the survey. Then we count up the total number of people who scored the celebrity or athlete or cartoon character, anything other than never seen them before. This means that they were at least familiar with the individual. Then we count up the total number of people who said it's, this individual is one of their favorites. If we take the total familiar divided by the total number of responses, we know the percentage of people who said they were at least familiar with the individual. If we take the total number of people who said that individual was their favorite and divide it by the total number of responses, we get the percentage of total favorite. Then we take the percentage of total favorite, divide it by the percentage familiar, and we derive the Q score. This can range from zero to 100. Let's illustrate how this might actually be used by a marketing researcher. Let's imagine that a marketer is looking to license the rights to use a particular comic book character for a product that they intend to sell targeting mothers with young children. Well here we have the Q score results specific for mothers with children that are two to five years old. 
in the overall uh, cartoon comic book world of individuals amongst mothers with children two to five year old, the Q score is typically a score of 19. But let's take a closer look at the comic book characters Iron Man, Batman, Superman, and Deadpool. Here we see Q scores of 35, 32, 25, and 11. If the presumption is that we want to license a comic book character that's popular and liked by mothers that have children two to five years old, it's rather apparent that Iron Man and Batman perform relatively high and should be part of the consideration, whereas Superman doesn't perform nearly as well, and Deadpool, despite I liking him, doesn't perform nearly as well compared to the other ones we were considering. Sorry, Deadpool. Many of the commercial services that are sold to marketers by marketing research companies provide reporting tools that allow the marketer to go in and explore the information and cut the information in a way that's useful to their personal needs. We've already talked about GFK's survey of the American consumer before. Let me show you a report that I was able to generate using GFK's university reporter tool. This is something that you'll be using yourself later this semester. In this particular case, I wanted to get a sense of condom purchases amongst adults with different household income levels. In particular, I wanted to see if there was a trend that changed in how people were buying condoms amongst different household income groups from 2012 to 2014, the most recent year that we have access to using the University Reporter tool. After I ran the report, I then calculated the percentage change in condom purchases amongst these different income groups from 2012 to 2014. And we noticed some really interesting results. Overall, 3% more people reported they purchased condoms from 2012 to 2014. However, amongst the higher household income groups from 75,000 and more, we see a, we see a change of a positive change of 9% and 16%, suggesting that there's a drastic increase in the number of condom purchases amongst those who are a little more affluent. Similarly, amongst those with very low household incomes, less than 20,000 or 20,000 to 30,000, we see above norm increase in condom purchases. Whereas in the middle income brackets, we see underperforming uh, changes and even decreases in condom purchases being reported. This could be a very interesting insight for those individuals who have to market to and sell condoms. We have an affluent group and a very low affluent group who are outperforming, whereas the middle income bracket is underperforming. This might suggest we need to think about changing our product mix our advertising campaigns, so on. Finally, while I mentioned earlier that we have to be careful about relying on Google and web searching to find useful secondary information for marketing research, that doesn't mean that there is no role for using useful web tools. For example, Google Trends can be a very useful tool to get a sense of what the public is interested in, or at least what they're searching for. For example, I think fanny packs are really cool. And I want to see if fanny packs are finally becoming that hot trend item that I really think they deserve to be. So from Google, I can search Google Trends and go to the trending tool and I'll search for fanny pack, a stylish and functional piece of clothing. Well, we can definitely see that the interest in fanny packs has increased over the years. For the sake of uh, making this a little easier to look at, I'm going to narrow the date range from 2010 to 2016. Of course, the real question is, if the interest in fanny packs is slowly increasing over time, and we notice some seasonal trends as well, the question is, is it how, how, how much is this term performing relative to maybe some other competing terms? So maybe as a silly example here, I'm going to search Snuggy. I sure hope that fanny pack's outperforming Snuggy. Ah, well, we see that Snuggy as a search term seems to have lost its luster, peaking in December 2010. However, if we zoom in a little closer, we see that fanny pack appears to have slowly, steadily started to defeat the search term Snuggy in terms of overall popularity. So I don't know if that's much to say for fanny packs, but we can perhaps say it's at least become more popular than the Snuggy. Now, for people who are new to looking at Google Trends results, 
you may be wondering, how do I actually interpret these numbers? For example, here at September 27th to August 3rd, 2015, Fanny Pack has a score of 73 and Snuggie has a score of 39. How do we actually interpret that? Well, <clears throat> what Google does is it gives you a relative interest value. So look for the absolute highest value amongst all the lines of the terms you're searching for. And we see that here for Snuggie at December 13th through the 19th of 2015. And Google, within this particular data set, sets this as our index value of 100. It's whatever the highest point is. So now, at any other point in our timeline, values of, say, about 50 could be interpreted as, compared to the peak search volume of Snuggie, Fanny Packs, having a value of about 50 here, whereas half as popular as the peak search time for Snuggies at this time point. So these numbers are all relative values, relative to whatever the peak was for that particular source. To wrap up, it should be clear that there's some key advantages of using external secondary information. First of all, secondary information is readily available. We are in a data-dense world when it comes to marketing in today's environment. Of course, it can be a little overwhelming to novices to know where to find the particular types of information that they're looking for. Secondary information is usually very inexpensive compared to primary research. It's also very quickly obtained. You're able to completely skip over the actual uh, execution of the research project and come right to the results and the analysis. In addition, secondary information can be an excellent supplement to your own primary research. Finally, it does help you define the scope of your primary data needs. Any marketing research project should start with a search for internal and external secondary information. If those sources do not adequately address the question that needs answering, then because of those gaps in information, it becomes much clearer the types of information that it has to be gathered through primary data collection. With that said, there's numerous disadvantages of external secondary information as well. Perhaps the most overwhelming feeling that you'll have when dealing with external secondary information is the sense that you'll almost have found exactly what you needed. Instead of finding the precise piece of information that'll actually answer your research question perfectly, you'll find something very near it, and then you have to make a judgment call about whether or not it's sufficiently adequate for your purposes. These first three disadvantages represent that almost there, but not quite there feeling. Oftentimes, external secondary information will come in an inc incompatible reporting unit. For example, maybe you have information at the county level through an se external secondary source, or you have information about craft beer drinkers in San Diego County, but because you plan on doing a direct mail campaign, you really need to know information about craft beer consumers at the zip code level. If you don't have that level of detail, you have an incompatible reporting unit undermining the use of secondary information for your answering your marketing research question. Oftentimes, the secondary information that you intend to use also has a mismatched problem. So for example, perhaps you find information about the number of beers that people typically buy in, in a week, but what you really need is the amount of money that they're spending on beer. So if you're a craft beer manufacturer who is looking to increase your prices or start to offer more expensive six packs of higher quality beer, it might not be enough just to know the number of beers that they're actually purchasing. You need to know which types of people are actually spending large quantities of money. However, if all you have is the number of beers that they're buying, you're left to make an assumption about how those two numbers correspond to one another. Finally, oftentimes secondary information will come with an unusable class definition. For example, let's imagine a secondary database where they define affluent households as households that make over $100,000 a year. However, Maybe you're a marketer of extremely high-end luxury bathroom fixtures. And your experience has taught you that actually to you, for you to sell successfully, you have to target households with income above $250,000 a year. If you have a marketing database that defines affluent households as having 100K or more, that means that anybody that you're analyzing will include, will include a large quantity of, of households that don't actually meet your criteria. This can be frustrating and in, in questions whether or not the secondary information will be useful for your purposes. Fourth, secondary information is often outdated. Earlier, when we showed you the GFK University Reporter data, we saw how here in 2016, at the time that this video was taken, 
The most recent information that we actually had reported was spring 2014. This is a challenging question for marketers to deal with. Is information from over two years ago appropriate and useful for today's market? Or is that information sufficiently outdated that there's a need to collect primary data to answer your research question? In the fast moving world of marketing, data can become outdated very fast. If information collected is more than a year or two years old, often a very difficult question has to be asked whether or not you can really rely on that information. Finally, external secondary information is, by definition, collected from somebody else, not you. Therefore, the quality of their research may be ambiguous. You're going to have to look very close to figure out whether or not the way that they conducted the research is of sufficient quality that you can trust these results for your particular research question. In the, in the next video, we'll do precisely that. We'll learn the sequence of steps that you, the marketing researcher, always have to go through when deciding whether or not external secondary information is of sufficient quality that you can use it to answer your research question.